to our Historical Writers Forum Zoom Talk. Today, our discussion will be about creating historical fantasy. We've had some great talks in the past about historical fiction. We've had some really heated discussion about history, like who the mysterious Elfgiva is in the Bayou Tapestry, but now we're going to get into the realm of fantasy. So first, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is K.S. Barton, and I write stories of love and adventure set in the Viking Age. In my novels, I explore themes of family, honor, and strength, all within the backdrop of Norse society. I've published three novels in my Norse Family Saga series, beginning with Warrior and Weaver. And I have a new book coming out this week, April 6th. Woo. And I am currently writing a historical fantasy series set in the Viking Age with Norse mythology as an inspiration for many of my characters and events. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say about writing historical fantasy. And that's me. And now let me introduce our panel. First, we have Stephanie Churchill. Your name is different on your picture, Stephanie. <laughs> So Stephanie Churchill is our first author. After serving time as an antitrust paralegal in Washington, D.C., then staying home to raise her children, Stephanie Churchill stumbled upon writing a career path she never saw coming. As a result of a social media encounter, Stephanie became fast friends with New York Times bestselling author Sharon K. Penman, who uttered the fateful words, have you ever thought about writing? She has since published three historically inspired fantasy novels, The Scribe's Daughter, The King's Daughter, and The King's Furies. Stephanie's stories, set in lush, layered settings, rely on deeply drawn and complex characters who navigate stories that explore the subtleties of imperfect people living in a gritty, sometimes dark world. Her unique blend of historical feeling, fiction, and low fantasy ensures that her books will please readers of historical fiction and fantasy literature alike. Welcome, Stephanie. Next, we have Marian L. Thorpe. Taught to read at the age of three, words have been central to Marian's life for as long as she can remember. A novelist, poet, and essayist, Marian has several degrees, none of which are related to writing. After two careers as a research scientist and an educator, she retired from salaried work and returned to writing things that weren't research papers or reports. And I imagine a lot more fun too. <laughs> Her first published work was poetry in small journals. Her first novel was released in 2015. Empire's Daughter is the first in the Empire's Legacy series. Second world historical fiction devoid of magic or otherworldly creatures and based to some extent on Northern Europe after the decline of Rome. In addition to her novels, Marion has read poetry, short stories, and nonfiction work at writers' festivals and other juried venues. Marion's other two passions in life are birding and landscape history, both of which are reflected in her books. Birding has taken her and her husband to all seven continents. Wow. Prior to the pandemic, she and her husband spent several months each year in the UK for both research and birding, and she is desperately hoping to return. Next, we have Selena B. Baker. Selena is an avid student of colonial America and, American Re and the American Revolution. She is a published author with a historical fantasy series about the American Revolution called Angels and Patriots, which has won 14 awards. She also has two standalone novels set in Victorian America and is working on the novel about the life of American Revolutionary War General Nathaniel Green. Her lifelong passion for history and all things supernatural led her to write historical fantasy, reading extensive traveling and graveyard prowling with her husband. Keep that passion alive. Selena holds a bachelor's degree in computer science. She lives in Austin, Texas. Welcome panelists. Thank you. Thank you. All Thank right. You. So first question. And I guess we'll ask, I'll ask each one of you, um, since you're first on my screen, Marion, <laughs> you can go first. Sure. Why did you choose to write historical or historically inspired fantasy as opposed to some other type of fantasy? So why place it in a historical setting? 
basically, I, what I write is what I call um, historical fiction of another world. And I based it on Northern Europe, more or less, after the decline of Rome, more or less, um, because I, it gave me a framework around which to build a world so that I didn't have to create every last detail. I could pull on existing uh, research, existing knowledge, and create a world that felt very familiar and yet foreign to many people. Um, maybe I'm just not creative enough to create a, a, a completely unique world, and I didn't want to create a magic system. So that's, that's really why. Nice. So Selena. Um, yes, kind of like what Marion said, um, I chose a historical fiction, well, historical background because that is my passion. Uh, two of my books that are set in Victorian America actually visited the towns um, that they're set in. And one of those towns was a national historic register of registered places town, the whole town was. So I started with that and it kind of led on to more um, staying with the, the, the history. Uh, that's my bigger interest is non-fiction history than it is fantasy. But I do like fantasy, I do like supernatural things. So I blended those together. Um, my American Revolution series was something that I've always been interested in the American Revolution. So I chose that background to, to do the whole series on. So also so I could learn more about that time period myself. I didn't feel like building magic systems like Marion said or some kind of high fantasy world that was just, I don't have the energy to do that. So that's why I did what I did. Okay. Stephanie? You're muted. Used to this. There, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I have to get used to this whole process. Um, I feel like one of the main reasons people read historical fiction is, um, is to enjoy a good story, but they also want to gain a deeper understanding of what life was like um, in a certain time or in a certain place. Um, readers of fantasy have a very different expectation for a fantasy book. Um, they don't come into it expecting accuracy, um, ex except within the confines of that specific world. Um, they want an escape. Um, as a reader, I love, I love history. I love to learn about history. I love the perspective that reading about um, history gives me um, and historical fiction fills that role for me. Um, but as a writer, I'm more interested in story, just story itself, not the details and the accuracy of history, um, which is what most historical fiction and nonfiction writers love. Um, Historical fiction gives writers the chance to tell a story within a landscape of accurate history. And I prefer to write a story within a landscape of familiarity, if not accuracy, uh, because my creative process gets locked <laughs> when I have to write within a certain boundary. Um, but that's an entirely different conversation for another panel discussion. Um, I think writing historical feeling or historically inspired fantasy the way I do it um, has one hallmark. It leaves my readers with a very strong sense of time and place, um, and it feels like something familiar, even if they can't quite pinpoint what or where. So I, I'm hearing a familiar, like a, a similar theme that you wanted to write fantasy and do something outside of the boundaries of like just straight historical fiction, but still keep that within the boundaries, like have the world already formed for you. It's a world you people already know, but then you're gonna play within that world and do some different things. Good. That makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like you all do quite a bit of research in your particular areas. Uh, so how much research have you done in your particular areas, even though you're writing fantasy and you don't have to be accurate or authentic? <laughs> How close to your time periods or your, your, your time period that you've, you know, you're closest to, if you're not doing one specific, you know, kind of like the feel of it, how much research do you do for that? Uh, Selena. 
<laughs> I do a lot of re I read hundreds of books about the American Revolution and I learn a lot of things from different really good resources. So for me, research is really super important because I do try to keep my, uh, like the American Revolution series kind of close to what's really happened. Not kind of, but pretty accurate. Uh, that series has angels in it. And I had to do research for those angels as well. And not like, I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about angel lore. There's a lot of it out there, Enochian lore. So that required a lot of research as well. So I didn't just sound like I was writing about a bunch of guys sitting on clouds with harps and halos. They needed to have some some kind of background of their own, something that they're fighting for as well. And so I do tons of real life nonfiction research for mine. A day, a daily, it's a daily task. And when you do your research, do you do a lot of it up front and then do some along the way or? Yes, I do both. I, I read all kinds of biographies and regular just books about battles and the war in general. And also I have to do it as I go along. There's so many websites that are valuable to me to write about the American Revolution. And also the Victorian American novels. I did a lot of research on them as I went, you know, what did babies wear diapers in 1869, you know, that kind of a thing. So um, research is really important to me. Great. Stephanie? Unmute myself this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for the longest time, uh, before I realized I was going to write anything, um, I, I've always been fascinated with um, the Middle Ages, um, particular, uh, particularly uh, British history. Um, and so I've, I've always had a very operational knowledge of the Middle Ages. And so for my first three books, um, which kind of mirrored, um, I would say, uh, a, a late medieval early Tudor ish feel to it. Um, I didn't have to do extensive research, um, but I did. Um, what I did was research for realism. Um, rather than for accuracy, which is what I mentioned um, in my my the last question you asked. Um, and I recognize that as a fantasy author, I can do what I want, um, but the majority of my readers are also fans of historical fiction. And while they might not care, um, or they might not say they care, I still like to make my settings believable, um, even if the events, events happening in my story um, could have happened in the historical places they know. Um, for instance, how reasonable was it for people to be wearing a particular fabric um, or what crops were grown, um, what did they eat at meals, that kind of thing. Um, and that would be research as I went along when, when I came to a particular scene. Huh, I wonder if this would have been normal or expected. Um, the whole idea is I don't, don't want the broad strokes of my story to pull the readers too, outside, uh, too, us, too far outside their comfort zone. Um, on the flip side, um, I've got two series I'm actively working on right now, two trilogies, and um, one of them reflects a time and culture from thousands of years ago in ancient Mesopotamia. And um, when I had the idea for it, I realized that I know nothing about that period of history. Um, so when I decided that was the device that was going to work for my world building, um, I spent three or four months solid just finding and reading um, academic books, journals, articles. Um, uh, for the period of around 2000 to 3000 BC, um, 3000 to 2000 BC. Um, and since it wasn't already familiar, it's been a lot harder for me to write freely within, within that, um, that, that context because I have to constantly refer back to my research. Um, so it slowed me down significantly. Um, so yeah, it, it's been a, a tale of opposite uh, extremes for me. Nice, thank you. Marian? Um, well, a bit like Stephanie said, when I started the series, and I'm seven books into it now, I was um, I was starting with an uh, enormous amount of background in um, early medieval Britain and post Roman British history. Been an interest of mine since teenage since I was a teenager, and so I had read extensively both fiction and nonfiction in the area, plus visited Britain multiple multiple times. 
So for the first book, mm, I didn't do all that much research, probably just little things. Um, but over the years, as my character's world has expanded, um, I've done much more research, university, full university courses in early medieval European history, uh, hundreds of books and articles. I just counted out of curiosity the number of books I bought specifically for this seventh book that I'm working on. One of my annoyances right now is that I live across the street from my university, um, my alma mater, but the library is closed to alumni during the, um, has been closed for two years during the pandemic, it's only open to students. So my library access has, has vanished. Um, so I have bought um, somewhere close to 20 books um, for this particular book, ranging for everything from history of the Praetorian Guard to uh, histories of the empresses of both uh, Byzantium and Rome, because my city, analog city, is sort of a combination of, of both Roman and Byzantium. So, yeah, and like Stephanie said, too, it's the little things, the details that you check what, you know, what, what the crops, uh, I once spent a couple of hours, I have a background in agricultural science, so it's not maybe as hard for me to do this as it is for some people, but how long was the growing season for wheat in the early Middle Ages in the north, basically in the Orkneys, <laughs> things like that. But yes, I'm constantly learning. There's a there's a um, seminar tomorrow afternoon from um, uh, from one of the Rome groups I follow on the economy of Rome, and it couldn't have come at a better time because the economy fits very strongly into the plot of the current book. So, so there's always things that are showing up, things I find on Twitter um, that I incorporate, um, and it's it's. It's three quarters of the fun for me in a way. I love research and I love learning. And then I just take all that stuff and put it in the book somewhere. Wow. I'm so impressed. You all have done so much research for your historical fantasy. So that sounds like a, a very strong theme of just really doing a lot of research and immersing yourselves in these, these worlds, even if you're combining them. Like, and, and yeah, that's really- Can I just add one more thing, sure. Tim? Of course. Um, I want to add to the, uh, the the research part of it. This isn't exactly answering your question, but um, it's another interesting part that for me goes with the research. Um, in researching Sumeria, for instance, with one of the series I'm working on right now, um, I needed to figure out a system of, of, of time. What did their calendar look like? And um, I'm trying not to copy exactly what Sumeria did, because I don't want people to think, oh, this is a book about Sumeria, because it's not. Um, so I'm taking in that research and changing names and, and that sort of thing. So trying to find a calendar um, is a challenge because um, in ancient Mesopotamia, every city was, they were city states. They were their own unique cultures. They all had their own calendars. And so um, that was an interesting challenge for me to try to figure out, okay, which one am I going to use? And then how then do I take that research and then twist it just enough that I can make it useful for my story? So that part takes um, probably as much time as the research itself, which is another little interesting twist to just add the fantasy element into it. So I have a, a follow-up question. To, so do you all find a sense of freedom in not having to follow, like being able to pick and choose like that, what you want to do instead of calling it historical fiction, where you'll get a lot of people who are very picky about, you know, the things that you include when you say you decide you're going to write fantasy and that way you can, you can pick and choose, you have control over the world and which one do you find freedom in that? Is that one of the reasons you chose <laughs> historical fantasy? Anyone's welcome to answer. <laughs> yes, it is for me. Definitely. Um, I, I, I often say that I'm too lazy to stick to stick to a real timeline. I like picking and choosing. I use the, uh, um, Various battles. I use the Battle of Stamford Bridge as a model for one of my, I hate writing battles, so I just choose other ones that are out there written up and borrow them. And um, uh, other, you know, famous Battle of Malden, for example, is the last battle in my first trilogy. It's out of place and it's out of time. It's happening earlier than it really happens. But I like that freedom to take little bits of history and use them in a way that feels, again, feels familiar, but isn't, I'm not stuck to the timeline. 
So it's almost like you're all creating your own like little time period, you know, your own little legends. Yeah. Does anybody else want to uh, hit on the, the freedom? I think for me, the first two books I wrote, which are standalones, um, like I said, in Victorian America, I felt a lot of freedom with those because I was, I guess I was kind of making up my own world, although they were set in a real time period. So I felt a lot of freedom with that to choose my supernatural um, interactions. I felt a little less freedom with the American Revolution series. Uh, but I did figure out, it took me a little while to figure out exactly how American patriots who believed in Providence would react to angels showing up in Boston during the first days of the, uh, the rebellion. So I, it took me a little while to get into a groove of that. And so by the time the series ended, I was feeling very confident about how the patriots and the British and everyone that was involved in the war were interacting with the angels. So um, that, I guess it kind of did give me some freedom eventually. At first I was really stressed about it and then I let, I let it go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would say for me, definitely the more freedom I have, <laughs> the more fun I have. Um, uh, I'll, I've got a motto, but I'll save that for another question that, <laughs> that we'll get to later. <laughs> So uh, what Selena was saying kind of leads me to my next question is if you do include fantastical elements or magic or anything that's supernatural, do you do something that would work within that time period? Are you taking things that pe the people in that time would have believed in like angels or something like that? Or, you know, do, do you ever just throw something in that wouldn't be within that time period, like something just totally different, like a dragon, you know, if you'd have it, if you would ever consider it or, and I know Stephanie, you don't use magic in yours and Marion, you said you don't use magic in yours either. So if you don't have fantastical things or magic, why did you choose to leave it out? So Selena, can we, can we start with you since you do have the supernatural, the, the angels? Um, so with, with the angels, I picked those, like I said, because providence, the belief in providence, divine, celestial, you know, looking down on um, everyone, angels and God's hand was a really big theme during the uh, colonial America was the enlightenment. And so, like I said, I went to that to see how I could blended in with the beliefs of the time period. So yes, that was definitely a big influence for me for that series. I have an, another book called The Shipbuilder, which is set in 1869 Maine. And there's magic in that, but it's actually called, um, I think it's called Obai. I never was never sure how to pronounce it, but it's a mixture of Christianity and voodoo from uh, India. And I think also Ethiopia. And I just stumbled on it for some reason, but it didn't really, it kind of fit the time period because Obai was believed in at that time, um, especially like in the Bahamas and places like that. And so um, I just kind of blended that one in randomly. I don't even, like I said, I don't even know where I stumbled on that. Um, there's also the belief in reincarnation in that book, which has nothing to do with the time period either. But uh, so that was a little more, it was fun, but the, ser the American Revolution series, I tried to stick with what people would believe in, and, and not everybody believed in angels. Uh, there were a lot of different religions, and, uh, and I enjoyed that part, that not everyone would believe in, in them coming to Earth and, and interacting and fighting in the war. Marianne, do you want to? Yeah, um, there's two parts to the answer, I guess. One is that um, I don't have magic. I do have my characters do or do not believe in their local gods, but those local gods are just versions of the Northern European, uh, Scandinavian, Celtic, Saxon gods and gods of Rome. Um, and why I left, didn't write magic into my 
series, essentially, as much as I love fantasy and, you know, grew up reading an awful lot of it, um, I didn't want there to be magical solutions to my character's problems. My books are very focused on uh, the consequences of choices and how you individuals respond to the situations they find themselves in, either through their choices or through um, situations that are beyond their control. Um, and I really didn't want that level of, uh, well, we'll, you know, the, something magical will happen and it will fix it. So, so I chose to not write magic at all beyond, there's one episode in the fourth title, well, the entire fourth title actually, which could be considered magical, but it's more about a belief in gods than anything else. And it's a version in some ways a retelling partly of the Orpheus myth. Hmm. Can I just add one thing to that? Sure. Um, that Miriam is saying, um, I didn't, in my Angels and Patriots series, I also did not want the angels <laughs> to change the course of the war. They would have been capable of doing it. So that was a challenge for me to keep them from doing it and who would keep them from doing it. In particular, George Washington would have said, no, you're not going to step up and just destroy the British Army because you can do it. So that was a challenge for me, too, was to keep the magic from influencing the outcome of the war. Hmm. I had never even thought about that with fantasy, about not allowing the, the magical creatures and magic to solve all the problems. Interesting. Stephanie? Um, well, like uh, we've already like you, you said already, um, Kim, um, I, I don't write magic. Um, it was an intentional choice not to do it for a very similar reason that Marion stated for herself. Um, <clears throat> so um, for those of you who might not geek out on story the way I do, um, what I write is technically called low fantasy. Um, I know you don't like that, that term, Kim, but it's what it's called. Um, and so the definition for that is... Um, fantasy stories which are of non-rational happenings that occur in a rational world where such things are not supposed to occur. Um, in other words, unless demonstrated otherwise by the author, you can assume the world works just as you'd expect it to, just like our own. It's fictional, of course, and so the geography might be strange, the culture's made up. Um, in my world, for example, there are no orcs or elves, there are only people acting as people do with some exceptions of rationality or magic, um, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, a superhero story um, is a good definition of what low fantasy is like. Um, and I actually have three, um, three, <laughs> three very different um, approaches to this question, Kim, within the three different series. Um, my first uh, published trilogy um, is probably the most, um, historical feeling um, in that it, it definitely reflected, um, as I said earlier, the medieval um, time period. Um, but there was nothing fantastical about it. There was no magic. There weren't even any non-rational happenings. It was all absolutely believable. Um, and it's, it's history that could have happened on earth. Um, <clears throat> the two series I'm working on actively right now, the, um, the ancient Mesopotamian series, actually does have creatures in it. Um, there will be dragon creatures in it. Um, and that's been kind of fun. Um, but that is the only element of, um, of uh, fantastical or non-rational, um, the only non-rational element in those books. Um, and uh, the other series that I'm very actively writing um, actually goes away completely from anything historical. It will be a lot more um, what people think of when they hear fantasy. So zero research. I'm not doing any historical research. It's completely made up. Um, and um, there are, are magical elements in it, though they aren't, um, um, they are more what I, how I defined earlier, the, uh, the non-rational types of um, um, magic. Uh, probably a thousand years into the history of this culture, their scientists we'll be able to come up with a scientific explanation for what these people in my stories are referring to as magic. That's interesting. Yeah, I like that. 
So what comes first when you're writing? Does it start with research? There the story, do characters pop up? Does it depend on the book you're writing or the series? You know, which one comes first? So uh, Stephanie, you wanna start that one off? Sure. Um, yes, <laughs> they all come first, <laughs> actually. Um, <clears throat> it's like asking which comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? That's, it's really, that's a hard question to answer. Um, but I'd say for me, it's um, definitely a layered approach. Um, usually my books start with the, the flash of a very specific scene. Um, I'm minding my own business, going about my day, and I have this scene with this character doing something that pops into my mind. And I'm like, huh. I wonder what that was. <laughs> Who is this person and what are they doing? And so that, that causes me to ask a question, which then turns into um, the theme or the seed idea for what's underlying that entire story. Um, <clears throat> so the theme inspire, inspires the story, which forms a character, which inspires the story, which grows the character, which moves the story. Um, so they all work together in lockstep, I would say. Um, and uh, it makes it tricky as I'm trying to uh, trying to get going because I don't know any of them well yet, so I'm not sure what direction it's going to take. But for me, it, it's definitely all three. And I know if I'm getting very distinct feeling about all three of those things, the, the character um, and the story and the theme, then I've got something going. Yes. I forgot to mention theme. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I can't write without theme, so. <laughs> ah, interesting, interesting. So, Marion. Um, much like Stephanie, uh, <laughs> things occur. Uh, when I started writing this series, which, and I started writing it in the late 90s, I was still working a very full-time, very demanding job. Um, so it didn't, took, a, took 15 years to write the first book. And... I had started with an image of a young woman in a fishing village on a coast that looked a whole lot like Anglesey, um, although that's not how it ended up in the geography I finally in, finally settled on. And it's really, and of course she's been um, either the narrator or major character all the way through the series. Um, it's very hard for me to separate the landscape that she was set in at the time from the character because they're they, they're interchangeable. Her story is very tied into the landscape and the world that she lives in. But it's always really, for me, it is always character first. The, the um, characters are what drive the story. Um, the themes is really, although the setting changes and the, the characters and the situations may change, it really is about the consequence of choices and, and, uh, and how we respond to those choices all the way through. And some bunch of some other sub themes on communication and where words fail us and what what can and can't be said and but, but yes it, for me it's definitely character and because I'm so far into this world that I've now been living in in my head since the late 90s um, you know the world it, even though I do all this research that world is very very real to me and I know how my characters interact with it um, so so yes characters for me nice Selena um, I would say the first book I wrote, which, like I said, was set in the Victorian America. This one was set in California. I had been to the town it was set in, and I, as corny as this sounds, I had a dream about it like seven years later. And so I had dreamt about a certain character, a couple of them, actually. So I would say with that book, the characters came first and the story revolved around it changed the story changing and whatnot. The second book, The Shipbuilder, set in Victorian Maine, was kind of also the same thing. I've been to Maine. Uh, the characters is kind of the world developed around them and who they were and what they were trying to achieve. There, uh, I have a big thing theme about redemption and doing the right thing and loyalty and coming together as a friendship. So the characters and how they behave toward each other is extremely important. And of course we had the bad guys who are trying to put kinks into that. 
But um, with the Angels and Patriots series, the Angels came first. And I actually did character sketches e of each one of them and actually in employed my husband in helping me do those, their names and, and everything. The characters in that book kind of um, came along as they as the war progressed. I already knew where I was starting. I knew who the Sons of Liberty were, Paul Revere, uh, people that some of you will already know who they are, John Adams. So I started with that. And um, then the characters evolved, like I said, as the war moved on and I had to incorporate them. And my big challenge with that was as the war progressed and more and more people were involved in the story, I had to figure out how they would react to the angels, whether they were General William Howe, who was in command of the British Army, or it was Washington, or Joseph Warren, or whoever was coming into the scene. And so I had to make decisions. Even Benjamin Franklin, he was a deist. And what would his view on angels be? So Angels and Patriots is a little different. The, like I said, the characters came first, the story evolved, and the research, of course, got extremely heavy with that. So mm -hmm. interesting, interesting. So I know at least Selena and Marion, according to your bios, you travel <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so I'm not going to ask if you've traveled for your research, but where so each one of you, where is uh, what is the, the best place or the you're the favorite place you've ever been, either for your research or that inspired you for your books. Uh, Marion, do you want to go first? Hadrian's Wall. Absolutely ah. no question about it. I, we went to Hadrian's Wall in March of 2014 uh, because I said to my husband, I need to go to Hadrian's Wall in the winter so I know what it feels like. And we had a week off, a uh, spring break in March. So he said, fine. Well, he'll say fine to any travel. Um, and so we went to Hadrian's Wall and spent a few days. But what was the, 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 what changed the course of the books, I think, was the <coughs> Museum at Vindolanda, uh, where, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Vindolanda is a Roman fort that was occupied from before Vin uh, Hadrian's Wall was built till much later. And in its archeological excavations, they found an enormous number of letters written by uh, Roman soldiers and Roman officers at the time. And it opened this real, world, opened eyes into the world of what day-to-day -day life was like in, on, on a Roman fort um, on the frontier. And that, spending that time there really, I think, changed the direction of where I went with the series. The second best thing I have ever done is I went to Rome uh, mm. for three days, just prior to the pandemic, February of 2020, uh, uh -huh. just prior to the pandemic. Um, I had a private tour guide looking, uh, specifically looking at fourth century Rome, which is what I had based my city of Castle on. And one of my readers said to me, um, not too long ago, actually, He's both part of my third book and all of my la latest book were the last published are set in Castle. And he said, I could tell the difference. He said that on the first one, you'd based it on research videos, fourth century reconstructions. And in the new one, you'd been there and I could tell the difference. Now he's also a big Rome buff, but nonetheless. So that was also a whirlwind trip, but it was so worth it. Ooh, that sounds great. Selena? Where's your favorite <clears throat> research trip? Boston, Massachusetts, three mm -hmm. times. Um, I, we spend a lot of time in Boston and the surrounding countryside, Lexington, Concord, where the first shots of the American Revolution took place. And um, I just adore being there. I feel close to the people that were there during the revolution, we go to cemeteries there. Of course, there's cemeteries all over Boston, all the old churches, all the history there. It's our absolute favorite place to go for. And, and just to refresh ourselves and say, hey, we're here again. Yay. You know, it's really a lot of fun. Um, we've also been to South Carolina a couple of times because the Revolutionary War was fought in the South as well. And uh, we've gone to a lot of the battlefields, the burial sites, um, 
we just absolutely love going there as well. And our daughter lives near Charleston, which helps. So that's that's my favorite places to go. And and, and uh, this month we're going to Pennsylvania and we'll be visiting uh, a bunch of the battlefield sites there during the American Revolution, Valley Forge. Um, we're, we're watching across the Delaware as well. So we're really looking forward to that. Nice, fun. Stephanie? Um, well, probably because I write the least um, historical of, of the three of us panelists, um, there isn't a lot of uh, travel that I that I need to rely on, which is good because I haven't done much of it. Um, uh, probably the most significant, um, two places that have probably been the most significant. Um, a, a girl who grew up in the American, the Great Plains of the American Midwest can only daydream what it's like to be in a castle. And so when you're growing up uh, daydreaming of, um, princes and princesses in the castles, you think you know what you're doing. <laughs> well, it was, it was finally our trip in um, 2013. Wow, that's a long time ago already. Um, we traveled around England and Wales and um, North Wales, uh, went to a lot of castles. Um, and that was definitely an eye-opening experience. Um, as the rest of my panelists have said, when you go into and um, there's just there's a, just a different experience um, to actually see and smell and um, and be in the room and feel the spaces. Um, so that that probably helped shape a little more of of um, my writing in that regard. Um, and as I think about it, probably the other biggest influence on my writing is honestly just where I live right now. Um, I live now in Minnesota, um, which for those of you who aren't familiar with Minnesota, um, I think Canada, it's very, um, you know, North woodsy feeling. Um, we have a, a, a place up North along a lake that is along, um, hundred acres of wetlands and woods. And um, so there's nothing better than just to go outside and go for a walk and walk through the woods um, and just hear nature, um, the smells and the sounds of the birds um, and the, the, the noise that the wind makes when it blows through the trees. Um, and so for anyone who's read my books, you know, I love setting. <laughs> um, I love to engage the senses in my writing. Um, and bringing in the, the sounds and the smells and the, the tastes and the touches. Um, and so um, that's not very um, sexy to say the woods, but <laughs> that's probably <laughs> the best I can do. <laughs> nice. So are there any books or authors who inspired you to become a writer? I know Stephanie's answer. Why don't I? Was... <laughs> you can probably skip me. <laughs> no, come on. You can... <laughs> there's plenty. I'm sure there's plenty of people who don't know that story. So go ahead. You can start. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, well, quite quite simply, um, it dates back to the advent of, of Facebook and social media. Um, I had uh, I was a big fan of historical fiction, as I said earlier, and um, one of my favorite authors was Sharon K. Penman, um, who those of you who don't know her, she writes, um, or she wrote, uh, she focused her writing on the Plantagenet family. Um, and so uh, Facebook came along and um, I began to interact with her as one does. And uh, definitely was a fangirl of her and uh, went through all of the emotions of, oh, she talked to me, she noticed me. And um, one thing led to another um, over the course of interacting with her. Um, she at one point said, have you ever thought about writing? Um, and I realized at that point that I had never thought of writing because it was something that I had taken for granted. And I assumed everybody enjoyed creative things, creative writing, daydreaming, coming up with stories in their head. Um, but it took her of everybody I know to offer that suggestion because I probably wouldn't have believed anyone else. Um, so from that time on, um, we began to uh, communicate um, very frequently. And um, she became a mentor, um, helped um, edit my first book for me a little bit and uh, got me started. So that's where, that's where it came from. Um, another humongous influence on my writing has been um, Stephen Lawhead, 
who um, also writes um, fantasy, historical, historical fantasy, mythic fantasy, those types of stories. Um, and I've been told by more than one person that my style is very similar to his. So I probably picked up a lot reading his books. Well, if you have to have a mentor, Sharon K. Penman is a pretty dang good one. <laughs> <laughs> I would absolutely agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's amazing. Uh, Selena. Um, honestly, I don't have any writers who influence me to become a writer. Uh, I would always wanted to write a novel since I was in high school, but I had kids in college and I was a busy person as everyone is. So it just kind of laid around the idea. And then when I did start writing, uh, it was terrible. The book was terrible. <laughs> I put it away. And I tried to write another book, but I didn't, I didn't really have anyone who was influencing me per se. Um, I read a lot of nonfiction and I don't really look at who the authors are. I, I hate to admit that because there are so many of them. Uh, there are a few that I like in particular, but they did not influence me. I, I will admit that I was a big Stephen King reader at one point. So some of that supernatural stuff probably rubbed off on me when I was writing. What I did do was I went and took a lot of writing classes because I realized that I was not ready to write a book and try to put it out there. So I spent just a lot of time trying to educate myself so that I could be a better writer. And, and yeah, and unfortunately, I can't say there was anyone who said, hey, you should write a book or any particular author that 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 made me want to write a book. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Marian. Uh, I suspect I've wanted to write since I first started reading. Uh, in all honesty, I think I probably did write from almost the time I first started reading. So again, no one particular person early on, but I would say that Mary Stewart with her um, Merlin trilogy, um, but I know there's five books in the series, but the first two or three are probably more influential. She basically sort of showed me how to write a history that didn't quite happen um, because you know there is, what do we know about Arthur? If, if he even really lived, but she can, she created a very convincing world. Um, and following her, uh, the Canadian uh, historical fantasy writer, Guy Gabriel Kay, who has taught me everything I know about how to slightly twist a world, slightly twist Northern European history into something that is recognizable, but isn't, um, isn't quite right. And then finally, a uh, late eighties, Ooh, late 70s, late 80-ish, 80s-ish, um, fantasy writer Elizabeth A. Lynn, who taught me how to write a non-heteronormative society without it being a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's just part of the world. So those three have probably, K especially, but those three have been my biggest influences. Great. So Sharon, do we want to open it up to to Q and A. <laughs> okay, yes, that time again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, there's a couple of questions in the chat first. So this is a really good one from Bandit Queen. Do any of the panel make their fantastic creatures or, or elements partisan, as in the Sleepy Hollow series, where the British are evil <laughs> and use demons, and the Americans are good and use white elements like angels or which or white witchcraft? So do you make your fantastic creatures partisan? <laughs> uh, Marion? <coughs> I don't have fantastic creatures, so <laughs> do you, I can't answer partisan, that. Do you have the good and bad partisan elements? Do you, do you have one set of people who are always good and one set who are always bad? No, no. I have one family that appears to be always bad, but in the current book, um, we're learning a lot more of their backstory and why their behavior has been the way it has been. 
Um, I don't <clears throat> like, I would, I don't like writing all bad, all good. All mm -hmm. my characters are flawed humans trying to do their best. Mm -hmm. Anyone um, else have any? Yeah, I will, I'll say that, uh, the, um, the one trilogy that I'm working on, that's the, um, the, the Sumerian, um, echo, I'll call it, um, has dragon-like creatures and they are very definitely, um, they're, they're the same creatures, um, but there are, uh, they are absolute opposite ends of the pole. Um, some of them are absolutely evil and some of them are absolutely good. So, um, yeah, so the one series that does have uh, fantastical creatures, definitely they're very partisan. <laughs> I had never thought about that word before, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Paula wants to know, Stephanie, do you have bears in your woods? <laughs> <laughs> do, uh, do I personally have bears in my woods? Uh, yes, we do. There are black bears in Minnesota and uh, they have been around our lake place. So Paula, if you want to come visit, we can take a tour. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in my novels, um, yeah, I would imagine there's bears out there um, because bears live in woods, right? Uh, but they haven't been a part of my stories, so. <laughs> <laughs> and John Baker wants to know if you all have support from your families. <laughs> Selena, you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question since John Baker is my husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> He's very, very, very supportive. My family is supportive. My sister is very supportive. My daughters have shunned the Angels and Patriots series because they're not, I think that they, they're very busy girls. They have their own families and it's a, it's a, it's a long read for them. There's a lot of battles and, and things in it. And I'll, I'll let them slide on that. They, they like the ship builder and the transcendent, but the short answer is yes, my family is supportive. Nice. Marion. My husband is my critique partner, my plot, my plotter, everything. If I'm stuck with the plot, I just bounce stuff <laughs> off him. We have worked out endless things on endless long walks. Um, yeah, he's completely and totally supportive. He's wonderful. Um, my sister is my copy editor um, and that's just about it for my family. So, so yes, they are. Nice, that's good. And Stephanie? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, we have reached a very um, operational arrangement where they leave me alone to do my thing. And I don't ask them to be involved in it whatsoever. Um, my husband is a uh, is an attorney. And so he has never read any of my books and he never will. And we're both fine with that. Um, to ask him to read creative writing, um, very different writing styles. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, they're, they're supportive. They let me do my thing. They leave me alone. And that's just how I like it. Yeah. Sounds good. So Kate Jewell is, has a discussion question for you all. Writing fictional characters in real historical fiction is a sort of historical fantasy. Discuss. <laughs> mm. Oh, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is, that's a can of worms, isn't it? That's, that's the kind of question that gets authors um, come into fistfights, I think. Um, I mean, I, I would say yes. Um, I'm not an authority on this because I don't write historical fiction, but um, that's the fiction part of historical fiction, right? Um, because you're guessing, you're, you're putting skin on historical facts and figures. Um, and it's the author's in interpretation, right? So, I mean, I think there has to be an element of fantasy because we don't know what the people thought about things um, unless they were really good at journaling, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't do that research, so. <laughs> didn't, didn't someone once, well, isn't there a definition between the difference between a historical novel and historical fiction that basically says historical fiction is set in a historical period with fictional characters as well as real characters, whereas a historical novel involves 
only historical uh, characters. I think I, I know I've read that. I think I have it right, but I have no idea whose definition it was. But I, agree I think that's a that, great one. Yeah, I agree that it, fic, it's fiction. I mean, anything set in, do, if, you set a, if you set a story in modern New York with fictional characters, uh, but also uh, Donald Trump or uh, Stephen Colbert in it, does that make it fantasy? I mean, it, you know, it's sort of the same question. No, I thought historic. This is just me. I thought historical fantasy's definition was historical fiction with supernatural elements. So I don't. Two of my books have completely made up characters, not the series, but the the standalones. So does that make it historical fantasy just like that? I don't. I don't see it like that. I see the supernatural elements making it fantasy, but that's just my point of view. And when I write, that's how I feel. I don't actually consider my books historical fantasy per se, but there's no other place to put them in the genre driven world. I do call them, I tongue in cheekingly, if that's a word, call them contrafactual fiction, because that is a term for books that are alternative history, historical fantasy. They're not alt history. They're not really, there's no, there's no real historical fantasy piece to it, but but we have this very genre uh, defined book world now and historical fantasy is a place I'm happy enough to be. Yeah, one of my books fits into the horror category as well. Um, the first book I wrote, I consider that horror crossed over with historical fantasy. Hmm. So Elizabeth Corbett asks, says, <clears throat> excuse me, for a story about the ancient Sumerians. So Stephanie, I'm assuming this is for you. Mm -hmm. Did you ever look at an ancient epic like Gomesh or something like that? Yeah, in fact, I've got uh, two copies of it behind me. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I've got, uh, yeah, yeah. If it if it's about Sumeria, um, if it was written, I've I've probably read it and I probably have it on my shelf. Um, there are uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh plays very heavily into my books, um, and I've taken, um, in fact, I quote pieces of it um, because I'm using that epic as um, some of the poetry that my characters will use, um, and I, I I change elements of it to change the names and that sort of thing. But yeah, definitely Gilgamesh is. Uh, Gilgamesh is actually a, a historical character in the book. His name has changed, but fun. And were, was there any other actual texts from the time that inspired you? There, uh, yes. <laughs> the, um, the historical figure in Heduana um, was the daughter of um, Sargon of Akkad, who was the founder of the Akkadian dynasty. Um, I had the full story in my mind before I started really doing the research on Samaria. And I came across in Hedwana and I discovered that eerily her story paralleled almost exactly the story that I was already telling. Um, and so I really dug into research about her and she was, um, she is known now as the first named poet um, in history. Um, she's the first person who has her name attributed with poetry. Um, and she wrote um, 40 hymns um, to the, the various gods and goddesses of the temples, um, um, along with some other poetry. So I've got a book about her and I, I've um, also integrated some of her poetry. So uh -oh. nice. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And Marion Paula wants to know where where your background is, your background picture. What's that of? <laughs> it's, um, they are bronze aged uh, round barrows uh, beside the Petters Way, which is a Roman road in Norfolk, just outside of Anmer, the village of Anmer, which happens to be where uh, Prince William's country house is. That's not far from where I live. <laughs> Interesting. Did you recognize it? No. <laughs> Um, but it looks a lot like the countryside around here anyway. But um, have you set any of your books there? No, uh, I have an apprentice novel I set in East Anglia in Norfolk, but I didn't. It's an apprentice novel and it will never see the light of day. The, <laughs> the bronze, those particular Bronze Age sparrows show up in my second book, but in a very different location. Um, so I steal bits of I steal bits of landscape from all over and <laughs> put them in different places. 
Thank the Bandit you. Queen wants to know, do any of your characters who do something wrong go on life journeys to find redemption? I think mm-hmm. I remember you saying something about redemption, Selena. Do you want to kick this off? Um, sure. In uh, The Shipbuilder, I had a character who kills for a living, kills people, kidnaps them. He's a horrible person and he he goes to Portugal and realizes that he needs to look at his life again, walks the streets, uh, the old cobblestone streets in Europe, and he tries to, to feel the fabric of that country in his, in his soul. And it's there that he realizes he needs to be a better person. And he acquires an amulet when he is there and he is given a, a, he's given a kind of an assignment and it's through this amulet, he can find some redemption, but he has to take it to a girl who lives in Maine and give it to her. She is looking for her soulmate, but she cannot find the soulmate because she's a very selfish young lady. And through this, through this amulet, she begins to learn lessons. And if she can learn her lessons and redeem herself, then Zach, who is the man looking for redemption, can redeem himself. So their journey together is, is you redeem yourself through me. I redeem yourself. You redeem yourself through me. I redeem myself through you. And that's a huge theme in that book is, is redemption and what you have to do to, to find it in other people. It might not be inside yourself, but you can find it elsewhere sometimes. And that's, that's, that's a huge theme in that particular book. Thanks. Does anybody else write about redemption? I do. Yeah. Um, two of my, my central male character um, who shows up in book two and will be present at least in memory, right through the series, is on a major redemption arc for a very, well, really the entire series, but for a portion of the first three or four books he's in, um, for a betrayal uh, that he thinks of as as just un, unredeemed, that he cannot redeem himself for because he has betrayed his country in a way that he just can't accept. And my current male MC, um, Drusius, is who's the most morally gray character I have ever written. Um, he is an assassin. He is uh, a spy. He is many things. He is also on a redemption arc that will take several books to um, finish. But interestingly, none of my women are on redemption arc, but my male <laughs> characters are. <laughs> Um, in thinking about that, that's a great question. I had never thought of it before that way. Um, but as I was listening to my other panelists answer their question, I realized that um, my first trilogy, the, pub, the tr- published trilogy that I have, absolutely has redemption um, for my characters. And I didn't realize it. So um, it's just not, not something they did that they're trying to redeem. It's something that has been done to them. And over the course of the, the book, they're looking for redemption. So it's kind of a, a twist on that, but it's absolutely there. And uh, that's, I'm gonna have to chew on that one for a little bit. So thank you for that question. <laughs> Let's see. John Baker asks, how does your environment influence your writing? Anybody? <laughs> you can all, somebody jump in. There's a lot of ways you can answer that question. Um, And so I'm going to take it very literally. Um, The environment that I'm sitting in um, absolutely influences my writing. Um, Until this past year, um, I had no office. Um, I sat at our dining room table with my laptop and I tried to write. And uh, it was very difficult to do it when I'm sitting. um, And I have the luxury of being able to write during the day. because I'm at home and I have that freedom to do it, but where I write definitely influences it. Um, six months ago, I was able to get an office and now it, uh, it it's definitely easier for me. Um, and then the other component to that too, I'll say is uh, I write better when it's sunny. <laughs> I you don't should know live why. here, I, Stephanie. You need to move here. I know. It's sunny all the time. I live the in time. the wrong, I absolutely, <laughs> for so many reasons, I live in the wrong state. <laughs> I can 
write anywhere li and have literally written everywhere. <laughs> I, I mean, we, we used to travel so much pre-pandemic that if I hadn't been able to write in airports and on airplanes and at picnic tables and on cruise ships, well, not cruise ships per se, but um, ships, uh, literally anywhere, I would never have gotten anything written. Um, but I need what's really bothered me in the last, been difficult for me in the last two years is I need to, I need to move, I need to walk um, and think. And during the height of the pandemic restrictions, that was really difficult. And the last two winters stuck in Canada, uh, where, which I have not been for many years, um, and it's been very cold and this particular winter has been very cold and snowy and icy and I'm not a spring chicken. Um, and so I can't get out and walk as much as I, as I used to. And I found this particular year very difficult from that point of view. And I'm so glad it's almost spring. So, yeah. So the environment definitely influences the writing process, if not the writing itself. Yeah, I spent some time, um, writing in a cemetery which was which for me because I liked a cemetery prowl was uh, very refreshing I enjoyed it it was quiet um, I could just feel the dead around me the history around me I wasn't writing about that time period I was writing about the American Revolution but I was in a Victorian cemetery writing the very first parts of the book I enjoyed that a lot, um, but I'm like Stephanie and I need my office. I have all my things around me, my books, my posters of the men that, I'm, that I have written about and I am writing about now, maps of the American Revolution. Everything is here and I just can feel it, you know, just kind of putting its arms around me. So for me, my environment is mostly where I go to write and shut the door. And um, I'm okay with any weather, raining, snowing, sunny. It doesn't matter. I'm all good. Good. And Elizabeth Corbett has a two-part question. First, do you all feel like this is a genre that will continue to grow? And second, do you have any advice for other writers who may want to branch out into this genre? Anyone? <laughs> I, I would say be brave and 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 go ahead and take that big step in whatever supernatural element you want to write about, whether it's angels or demons or dragons. Just be brave and 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 do it. Just do it. Don't be don't be shy about writing about those kind of elements. Um. I'm, let's see, I am unmuted. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I had to let my dog in, so I muted myself again. Um, I'm going to answer this, the second part of the question first, um, because that'll bring me back to the first part. Um, the advice part is, um, I think first and foremost, you need to figure out why you're writing. Um, what is your purpose in writing? Um, because there are two very distinct paths. If you are writing for yourself, because you can't not write, um, if you're writing and you don't necessarily care if you become a commercial author, um, meaning you intend to regularly and routinely make money from your writing. Um, if you don't care about that part of it, um, then my answer to your first question is, it doesn't matter where the genre is going because you're writing it because you have to and write it because you love. And my advice to you would be write what you love um, and that's all you need. Um, but if you, if you, if you, if part of your writing, your need to write is because you want to be selling books, um, you want to make a name for yourself. Sorry, my dog opened my door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those pesky I have animals. <laughs> I have a little dog. Who, this is her room. And apparently my family has left. And so she's, you know, in and out. So sorry. Um, anyway, so as I was saying, if, if you decide that commercial um, commercial writing is something that you really want to do, um, then my advice is different because then you really need to do your research um, before you start writing, before you decide on um, what you're going to write. You really need to understand genre. You need to understand marketing genre. Um, you need to understand what are the structural elements of your chosen genre. 
and you need to write to those elements um, because that will determine a lot. Um, mentioned earlier in this uh, conversation, um, Sharon Penman was my um, mentor, inspiration, um, <laughs> my right hand woman. And uh, her, her very first piece of advice to me was write for yourself. Don't write for um, the public, don't write for editors, don't write for publishers. And I, I, I took her advice on that. Um, and so I just wrote the story that was on my heart. Um, what I found out long into the process was my books are very difficult to market um, for all the reasons that we've been talking about. And Marianne touched on it um, because they don't fit um, a particular marketing genre. So just to repeat myself again, decide why you're writing. Um, what your goals are. Um, if you're just writing for yourself, it doesn't matter. Um, you write what's on your heart. But if you if you're gonna write, if you want to write and your goal is to make money, do your homework. Yeah, definitely. So Kathy Dunn asks, as part of the fantasy part of your novels, do any of your characters have more modern traits or views, or do you try to keep them as authentic to their times as possible? Um, yes, probably because what my books, because part of my book of the societies in my books are completely non heteronormative. Um, so that same sex relationships are the, are actually the norm rather than the, um, exception, partly because of the societal structure. Um, then I suppose you could say that the attitudes might be taken as more modern, although, um, there are have been and are societies in the world that are not um, perhaps what we would consider modern, but who still can, who still accept same sex relationships without a question. So that would be probably the biggest for my books, where that's that's central to the world I've created, and um, and so it would be seen as a more modern viewpoint than than the times might, the, the times that I am echoing might otherwise have. Um, my books definitely, I, I intentionally set out to, um, to keep them comfortably familiar within the era I'm trying to recreate or trying to, to mimic. Um, I, I had said earlier in answer to one of the questions that my goal is um, not to pull readers out of the story. I want it to feel familiar to what they would expect. And so if I'm trying to mimic a particular era, um, I try to I try to write elements that would would feel right for that. So <laughs> All right, last question. Best piece of advice for writers who are just starting out? Well, Stephanie already touched on quite a bit of it. <laughs> Any, <laughs> anyone else have any, or you have anything to add or Marianne or, or Selena have anything to add? Um, I would add, <laughs> oh, sorry, <Yeah>. go ahead. <laughs> oh, fair. it's okay. No, seriously, it's the one, it is the piece of advice I give everyone who asks is you, you've got to read, you've got to read a lot. You've got to read outside of the genre you want to write in. Yeah. You need to read poetry so you understand about cadence and rhythm and and how words how the sound of words affects the reader's experience. Um, you, you just need you do need to read a lot and if you read a lot and absorb, you'll absorb not just good writing but story structure and uh -huh. and uh, discover what style you like because you know there's everything from Hemingway's terseness to uh, you know, purple prose that people love and where do you fall in between in your own style? Mm -hmm. I would, my piece of advice is to be patient. Um, I, I know that sounds simple, but it isn't always when you're trying to write. A lot of people abandon their books because they're impatient. They don't feel the story's going the way they want it to go or they get lost along the way or for whatever many, many reasons. So patience is a virtue when you're writing books. The first draft is gonna be horrible. And if you're a new writer, you're gonna think you're a horrible writer and you're not. You just need time, practice, patience. 
And be careful about advice out there. There's a lot of advice for writers and some of it is in material. Some of it's good, some of it's bad. And it takes a really long time to learn what A suits you, B, what you can market. Historical fantasy is, is a very hard genre to market as someone else touched on. Um, a lot of people don't want to believe worlds that collide together. So um, you just have to be patient with yourself and, and, and let time take care of it as far as learning to be a writer. Stephanie, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> no, oh. this is the culprit here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think, I think I, I, I said everything and these two added anything else that I would have said. So excellent advice. All right. I think that's a great place to stop. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie, Marion, and Selena for being our guests 